My family used to go camping with a few groups of friends when I was a kid. I remember one Christmas when I was about five we were camping out in the bush. There were nine kids in total at our campsite. We were allowed to wander through the bush. The parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp, we never wandered far. Anyway, out of nowhere an unfamiliar voice came over our walkie-talkie. It was a man's voice. He said he was Santa and that he was trying to find us to give us our presents and asked us to look for him. We all ran back to our campsite all excited that Santa had talked us. The walkie-talkie was taken off us and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of the trip. We were pretty devastated at the time. But I understand the seriousness and creepiness of it now looking back as an adult. Of the countless hours I've spent in the woods, it's the one time, the only few seconds, that I can't explain. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early, or staying out late, to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes, walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under our canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, river bank, lake shore, ridge, bottoms, bogs, and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important you understand I've heard, seen, and smelt about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience though happened at about 0430 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes, another hour past that until sunrise. I was on mile 5. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack. And I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 0430 in springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing. Dead quiet. Mid-step I froze. When fight or flight kicks and you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around, and I'm going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was damn sure I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice, well, that meant get out of here. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a smallish tree. More a fungo bat sized stick, than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, and not a thud or thump. And I have described it as, explosive, in the past because it was so sudden, and so terribly loud. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud, and clear. Now, as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound came from. And I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come to a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant, as soon as I got the courage to move towards this noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it, and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head somewhere between meth fiend murder, and Bigfoot bludgeoning. Minutes pass. I just breathe my foggy breath into my glasses, and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light. I crank up the headlamp, and start to slowly creep to the 180 turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. It didn't help. I get to the turn, and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point. Trying to be quiet. Taking tiny, shallow breaths so I can listen while humping it up the trail. And then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. 
I just imagine wet, rotten, death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled, strange. I kept walking fast. By the time I made the top of that ridge, I was huffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out, and the birds were chirping. I've heard it all in our woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what the hell that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard it many times. I don't know. I was camping alone on a beach a few years ago. At just after 3 am, I woke up to a strange sound, like something was gently brushing up against the tent. The waves were pretty loud, so I wasn't sure. As I started to fall back asleep, I heard it again. This time, I sat up. Suddenly, the sides of my tent were getting pushed in. I could see the shapes of hands pushing it in on all sides. No sounds came from outside other than the ocean. I was too terrified to even say a word. I've never been that scared in my life. After a few seconds that felt like an hour, it suddenly stopped. I waited for a few minutes, then unzipped the tent and poked my head out and flicked on a flashlight. There were shoe prints all around the tent. I figure it was probably just some kids messing with me. But damn, did they ever mess with me. In the middle of the night, I want to say around 1 am, I'm woken up to the sound of gunshots. Two of the other friends in my tent also woke up. It sounded like the gunshots were getting closer and closer over the course of a half hour. It went from that sounds far away to that sounds like a bullet hit something in camp. Like I said, this was a state park. Hunting is illegal, which either meant some reckless hunter was ignoring the law and hunting after midnight, or some deranged lunatic was just walking around shooting into the woods. Friends and I stayed low to the ground, afraid that a stray bullet would come into our tent. Eventually we began to see spotlights crossing over the roof of our tent as some state troopers in a helicopter began searching the area for the suspect. An hour after we first heard the gunshots we heard some police sirens on the main road above us. The campsite was located at the bottom of a valley. There were shouts of drop the weapon. I said drop the weapon. A few more gunshots, the sounds of some frantic scrambling and shouting instructions, then eventually silence. The next morning, we went to ask the campsite managers if they knew what happened last night. It turns out there was a guy who lived in a house that was higher up the side of the mountain, above the main road. He did some meth that night, and decided that it would be fun to fire his gun at any cars that passed on the main road. The state troopers arrived and arrested him. There were bullet holes in some of the trees around camp, and in one of the RVs that was parked in one of the neighboring campsites. I'm really relieved that no one was hurt or killed by the gunman. Especially after seeing how close those bullets came to going through some of the campers' tents. Edit, crazed gunman did some meth and fired some shots down the side of a mountain into the valley where I was camping. was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves in trouble, big trouble. It was around 7 am when I found the campsite. First thing that hit me was the eerie stillness, until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree, and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit and went over to the person, they looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map and hightailed it to the closest road, this was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag someone down. 
They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue arrived, and I led them to the still unidentified individual, he was not very conversive when I helped him out, I was sure he would be dead before we arrived, but was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out, and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person we helped out. I got home three days later, and there was a message on my machine. The story was that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent, and its occupant, in attempt to climb the tree to get to the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. Dude survived, and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. This happened to some friends of mine in Sydney, Australia. When we wanted to go underage drinking we would buy a case of beer or bottle of spirits and hike about 4 kms into the bush to the middle of nowhere to drink without worrying about getting into trouble. Would sleep in a sleeping bag under the stars in summer and be fine. So one afternoon my friends, without me this time, headed off with beer to the usual camp spot we'd use. Being young and stupid no one checked the weather forecast otherwise they'd have no heavy rain was on the way. In the middle of the night five drunk teenagers left the campsite to shelter in caves nearby. The caves sit high up overlooking a large fork in the Hawkesbury River. Soaked from the rain and cold, they started to dig a fire pit. Unfortunately they dug up human remains, were too drunk to return home so spent a miserable night in the rain waiting for dawn. Didn't dare stay anywhere near the caves. The police investigated and discovered the remains were in very old aboriginal burial site and were relocated to avoid being accidentally disturbed again. Walking a section of the Appalachian Trail with a couple of buddies when we happened across a bundle of sticks. The sticks were made into a figure kinda similar to the ones from the Blair Witch Project. It was obviously placed there by someone, as it was dead center on the middle of the trail, leaning against a rock. I thought it was cool, so I grabbed it and put it in my backpack. Anyway, we finished the hike and set up for the night in our camping spot. We were all pretty wiped out from the long day, so after dinner we retired to our respective tents and conked out for the night. The next morning, I was the first one awake, so I got up to make the coffee, and what did I find? An identical bundle of sticks to the one we'd found, sitting atop the pile of charred wood from the previous night's fire. First thing I did was check my pack, and sure enough the one I'd picked up was still there. Each of my friends swore they didn't put it there, and I obviously said the same. It was weird because we were all adamant about not putting it there, but I can never be sure one of them wasn't messing with the other two of us. The thing that messes with me is the bundle I found in the morning was almost an exact replica of the one we found on the trail earlier. And, I find it hard to believe one of the other guys could have made such a close replica without being able to model it after the one in my pack. And it's not like either would have placed the one on the trail beforehand for us to stumble upon, as it was far out in the middle of nowhere. I want to believe one of them pulled a prank on the other two because the alternative scares the living out of me. The Hartsville Mantis Man. It's a hot, humid, sticky summer this year. Makes camping miserable, even though I still find myself out here doing it. Even in the confines of my tent and the shade from the large pine looming over it, I still struggle to breathe a holy, satisfying breath. I peered out from the tent, my haven, sheltering me from the late afternoon blaze, to see my brother, Tony, casting out at the nearby pond. He seemed distracted, his mind momentarily drifting from the possibilities of pulling up more bluegill, and instead studying the tree line across the pond. His eyes shifted back and forth, 
though his being stood absolutely still. You good, dude? He jumped and cursed as I yelled. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Could you come over here for a minute? He said, quietly, cautiously. I stood, pushing the flap to the tent open as I lazily made my way over to him. The sun was unrelenting and the air was heavy, leaving me a meandering idiot on my way to the shore. I looked out to the horizon, shielding my face from the intrusive sunbeams. Tony pointed to everywhere in general and nowhere in particular, I had a hard time seeing what he wanted me to see. His finger shifted from tree to tree, bouncing back and forth. Don't you see it? He whispered. I looked over to my older brother, his lip was quivering violently. I shoved him, nearly knocking him on his ass. Quit messing with me, I don't see nothing, I spat as I walked over to the dock, trying to get a better look. Though I doubt Therese anything to be seen. Just watch, he said quietly. I shot him another dirty look before turning my attention back to the pines across the pond. I watched, studied, each and every one of the massive trees, half expecting to actually see something, for one of my brother's ridiculous made-up creatures to somehow materialize. I know as soon as I fall for his stupid joke he'd have a bad eating grin on his face, punch me in the arm and yell gotcha. That's typically how it went with Tony. I hate to say that I actually did see something, something darting and hopping from tree to tree, but I did. What I hated even more was that, when I told Tony what I had seen, he didn't have his normal gotcha reaction, but instead began slowly moving backward. His entire body was visibly trembling. I'm not sure what it was that I was seeing, it moved too fast, too quickly for me to give a good description. Though I could swear it looked almost human, like a person with really long arms. I turned to go grab the binoculars from the tent, adrenaline replacing my heat-induced stupor. I was about halfway to the tent when Tony spoke out once more. I think it's just a hunter, the relief in his voice was palpable. I returned my attention to the spot across the pond we'd been watching, and to my surprise, there walking along the tree line, was a man clad in a bright orange vest and a gun slung over his shoulder. I laughed, a cautious wheeze lost in the light breeze which the evening brought with it. The sun was slowly sliding down the horizon, dipping its toes beneath the tops of the pines. The heat's getting to us, man, I'm about to cook dinner, come help me start this fire, I called out to Tony, trying to get his mind off of things. It was weird reassuring my older brother, usually he was the more level-headed of us. Yeah. Yeah, sorry dude, I'll be over in a second, he replied, beginning the short venture from the shore to our tent, stealing glances at the trees as he went. The next couple of hours went by unceremoniously. Tony had built a roaring fire, something he'd mastered since I started bringing him on these camping adventures with me. I scooped a glob of homemade butter from a mason jar I'd brought and plopped it into the skillet which sat over the fire. Tony and I had a pretty good routine at this point, he'd fillet the fish and I'd throw it in the skillet so we could eat as we worked. The fire crackled and snapped, coupled with the croaking frogs and birds chirping overhead, it had created a peaceful ambience. This is what it was all about. This is what made enduring the heat all worthwhile. Though I couldn't shake the feeling that something, somewhere was watching us. I marked it down as residual anxiety from the hunter we'd seen earlier. The silence was abruptly broken, I think that hunter was looking for something, Tony said, turning his gaze to me. I looked down at the fire, studying it as I tried to formulate a good response. What do you mean? Was the best I could come up with, but I knew what he meant. He and I both knew there was something else out there, though I had been trying my best to tuck it away in the depths of my brain. Did you really not see it? That thing? I mean it was pretty big, he trailed off, bringing a forkful of fish to his mouth. The darkness was beginning to seep in, but I could see his eyes shifting back and forth among the trees which surrounded our sight. His anxiety renewed my worries, the feeling of being watched grew stronger with each passing minute. I mean, I'm sure we're being watched. Our presence is being studied by thousands of tiny eyes, the frogs, the birds, the opossums, the raccoons, 
and whatever else calls Hartsville Park its home. Hell, even the carcasses of the fish we'd pulled up hours before seemed like they were studying us with their glassy, dead eyes. But this was different. Whatever was out there, whatever was analyzing our every move, felt predatory. I think we both nearly jumped out of our own skin when a thick branch let out a loud crunch from behind my truck, which sat nearby the tent. We both shot up to our feet and backed away, nowhere to run with the pond being behind us. Hello? A deep, husky voice called out to us. Tony and I looked towards each other, our faces marred with terror. If this was still a prank he was playing on me, then he deserves an Oscar for this performance. Hello? I'm real sorry to bother but is anyone here? I'm Ranger Thompson with the Hartsville Park Security, the man informed, walking out from behind the truck. It was the hunter from earlier, his orange vest the only thing visible in the darkness he was shrouded in. You scared us dude, Tony blurted out, his breaths coming in rapid, guttural successions. The ranger walked closer to us, closer to the light from the fire which revealed his bearded face. Somewhere between a ranger, a hunter, and a lumberjack is the best way I could describe him. My apologies, sir, he said matter-of-factly, you boys should probably pack up and head out of here as soon as you can, he continued. Tony and I exchanged curious glances, we'd never had anything like this happen to us on one of our camping excursions before. Something was definitely off, between what we had seen earlier and the perpetual feeling of being watched, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread washing over anew. Why? Tony asked incredulously. The ranger lowered his head a bit, deep in thought, unsure of his next words. He kicked at the dirt a bit before returning his gaze to us. Well, it sounds kinda silly but I heavily advise you folks to take my words as fact, he spoke, a mix of serious and somber in his voice. We stood there, a whirlwind of emotions as he told us of a creature which was stalking the park, the park which we found ourselves in now. He described it as tall and humanoid in appearance, but when he remarked that it had extremely long arms, well, that's when I knew the thing we had seen earlier was very much real. I saw it up pretty close, right across this pond here, he gestured towards the water, which looked more like a hungry void at this point in the night, its eyes were like the size of footballs on the sides of its head. Had these beady, little pupils. He regaled every last detail, most likely in hopes of scaring us off. Its arms, well I think they were arms, he chuckled quietly, had these like, teeth, like they folded and almost like a T-Rex or something. But the insides of its arms had these spines, teeth, whatever you want to call them. He frowned as he told us, his voice growing quieter as he spoke, seemingly afraid of it hearing him. I tried to shoot him but it was too chew, the ranger was cut off by what sounded like someone tearing a sheet of fabric in half. A long, jagged appendage emerged from his chest. Ranger Thompson's eyes were the size of quarters, falling from us and peering down to his chest as a stream of blood began trickling down his lip. A massive pool of blood had begun to form at his feet, this man was beyond saving, and that was before the creature whipped its arm and slammed him into a tree. Ranger Thompson went limp. Dead. I tried to speak, to scream but instead a quiet, throaty whimper escaped my throat. The thing stood there, massive but gangly, studying us with its giant eyes. Those beady pupils shifted from us to our campsite, darting all about, taking in every detail of its environment. Plotting its next move, the most efficient way to dispose of us. As far back as humans go, to the earliest known inhabitants of our kind, we came equipped with a way of dealing with predators. Fight, flight or freeze. A lot of people forget about freeze, but I didn't, because that's exactly what I did. If it wasn't for Tony, my brother, I would surely have been this thing's dinner as it lurched at us with dizzying speed. I fell to the ground, just out of harm's way, and standing in my place was my brother who took the brunt of the creature's attack. When I looked up, its back was facing me and it had Tony pinned up against the tree. He screamed out my name, calling for me with desperation. My senses seemed to all come flooding back, putting my adrenaline to use. The ranger had a gun. 
I hopped to my feet and scurried over to the dead man's body, quickly flipping him onto his stomach and tearing the shotgun free of its sling. Truthfully, I had never shot a gun up to that point, which seemed silly after painting this picture of an outdoorsman. I was a peaceful one up until then. I cocked the gun and aimed it for the thing's back. I pulled the trigger. I pulled the trigger and the gun blasted with a deafening roar. My vision went blurry for a moment, stars swirling in and out of view as the blast sent me stumbling backwards a bit. This all happened 38 years ago today. I was 19 then, a young man with dreams of traveling the world and meeting new people, maybe even finding love with someone along the way. I'll never forget when I came to, that gun trembling so violently in my hands, my brother's head splattered against the tree from the bullet. The creature nowhere in sight. I had gone into a sort of comatose state after that. They found me curled up in a ball, my head on my deceased brother's lap. I was charged with two counts of manslaughter, obviously my fingerprints on the gun and the two dead men lying next to me didn't look so good. I stuck to my story, to the truth, about what I had experienced that night, about what had happened to my brother and Ranger Thompson. It all worked out in my favor in the end as my defense used an insanity plea to spare me of death. Though I probably deserved to die, I would end up spending the next 38 years in Hartsville Mental Institute. I write this to you all as I sit here on the bus, waiting for my stop. I want you all to know that everything I have said is the truth, and I'm sticking to that until the day I die, which will very likely be today. Because today, after 38 years of waiting, after 38 years plotting my revenge, I'm returning to the Hartsville Park where it all began. Ten years ago when I was a skinny little 17-year-old I was hiking the rural side of a levee with a friend who was even scrawnier than I was. It was a long, long, walk into the woods and for about an hour or more we hadn't seen anyone else. Just trees and foliage. We finally stumbled upon a huge nest looking area. It was so random and out of place so we investigated. There was paper and cloth everywhere, torn magazine pages, old clothes, cans, everything piled into one huge mess. We assumed maybe people drove their truck out here and dumped their trash, so we just turned to leave but in that very moment we saw a tall rugged man wearing all black staring right at us. He was maybe 6ft3, had shaggy unkept hair, and looked dirty and disturbed. He stood 15 feet away, and he was just staring and silent. My friend didn't say something so I said hi. Do you live here, is this your stuff? And he only nodded yes and then we slowly backed away and left. He just stared at us until we could no longer see him anymore and then we picked up speed to get back to civilization. I was hiking across Newfoundland, following an old railway that was long ago disassembled and turned into a giant trail, sleeping wherever I found myself at night. One day I ran into a small cottage town, except everything was abandoned. Trailers falling apart, bus conversions burnt out, small cabins all shuttered up. It was creepy but interesting at the same time. The sun was waning so I decided to set up camp in a mostly empty lot that had an abandoned truck slowly falling into a ravine near it. Cooked up some food and crawled into my tent to sleep. I wake up sometime in the night and I hear footsteps outside my tent. At first I think it's an animal but the steps sound like someone walking, a human. The steps get closer and go around my tent. I slowly and quietly pull out my knife, if he tries to get in my plan is to stab first and ask questions later. Anyone trying to get into my tent at night in the middle of nowhere is looking to do some kind of harm. My heart is racing at this point but I try to just be quiet. Luckily the steps start moving away from the tent until I can't hear them anymore. I wait a bit to see if they'll come back but I don't hear anything. I slowly get out of my tent, I don't see anything. Without turning on my flashlight I quickly take down everything and stuff it into my bag. After that I just started walking down the trail to get the hell out of there. I walked until daytime, 
came across a road and flagged down a truck. That guy was nice and drove me to town where I got a hotel. The creepy thing, when I think back to it, was that whoever that was likely watched me walk into town from one of the abandoned structures. I'm guessing a squatter. I'd like to think he was just curious but I'm glad I didn't stay and wait to see if he'd be back. I have pictures of that cottage town and my campsite that night. Solo backpacker here. Haven't had it happen yet, but I always worry about stumbling across a pot grow. I've found abandoned ones, never an active one, thankfully. One time I found a completely empty gallon milk jug sitting on a rock in the middle of a creek, an inch above the water line, with some water splashed on surrounding rocks like somebody had just walked down the middle of the creek. The rocks were in a shallow spot, but there were two deep pools on either side, so they would have been in the water at least up to their hips to get away down the creek. Creepy because there was no sign of anyone around, the creek had flooded the night before, jug was clean, whole, undented and dry, looked brand new, had not been in the flood water, there were no tracks on the bank, and it would have been close to impossible for anyone else to have been in that narrow canyon without me being aware of them. I'd have seen their tracks and or seen them. No explanation for it other than that somebody had heard me coming, and scampered down the middle of the creek to avoid leaving tracks before climbing out somewhere where the bank was rocky, and hiding. I left that area in a hurry. Same area, another trip, somebody lit my campsite up from directly above with a high-powered spotlight in the middle of the night. Nobody around, no aircraft overhead, no trees big enough to hide a person, nothing. Absolute dead silence, I would have heard branches cracking if there was anybody in the trees above me, or anywhere around. I've mistaken elk for bears in the middle of the night a few times. Never had a bear in my camp, but I've had elk more than a few times, and it's always good for some heart racing panic until you get a positive ID on the large critter bumping around camp. My partner and I were deep in Mount Adams Wilderness Area, Washington State, US, and there were no other campers around. We had spent the day fishing and exploring the creek around our camp. Around 2 AM, he wakes me up and tells me to be quiet. Our little dog is quietly growling and looking in one direction. About 15 yards north of the tent, I can hear rustling and a woman's voice speaking quietly to herself, couldn't discern any words. There is no light, just the voice and the walking noise. It goes quiet and then picks back up on the other side of the tent, which is even deeper woods, then it faded off into the dense forest. My partner had literally grabbed his gun and was getting ready to confront them but since it seemed to move on, nothing ever came of it. I cannot stress enough how deep these woods were. We had explored the day before and I had scratches from twigs and branches it was so dense. The fact that there was someone alone wandering around talking to themselves in the middle of the night without a light or camp is so freaky and I still get chills whenever I think about it. The next morning we investigated and didn't find any tracks, but there was a really haphazardly lit fire, charred remains, in the middle of forest slash logging road about a mile up. It was still kind of warm. I know there is a small town, about 150 people, about 10 miles south from where we were camped. So maybe it was a drunk teenager? We were almost touching the Yakima Indian Reservation also, and the logging roads were still actively used. But still, so bizarre. Sorry for formatting also, I'm on mobile. Was hiking solo in the White Mountains, attempting to summit Mount Adams via the airline trail. The presidentials were totally socked in with fog, wind and some rain. Could not see more than a couple inches in front of me. I doubled back to the Madison Springs hut to review my options, and decided to climb to the top of Madison and go down the backside on the Watson path to make my way back to my original trailhead. The Watson path was tricky because A, it's all granite boulders at the top which were B, very slippery due to the weather and C, totally socked in from the fog and D, no one else is on the trail that day. And I start thinking, 
Man, if I break an ankle or take a header on these slick boulders, no one is going to find me for a long time and I start to get the nerves, and I'm carefully picking my way through the fog, barely able to make out the next cairn. When all of a sudden there is a brief break in the fog and I see this giant black thing down the trail in front of me, inkily appearing and disappearing through the fog, and my mind immediately thinks bear. It's not more than 150 feet from me. And I'm peering through the fog. And I edge closer and yell at the thing. And I'm squinting and trying to make out what is. Ultimately a big upturned tree stump. Yes, I had the bejesus scared out of me by a dead tree. That thing really got my adrenaline going. It was probably the best lesson I've had with how stress and adrenaline can really change your perception of your environs. I was absolutely convinced that thing was a bear. As I got closer to it, it was so obviously not a bear. But for those two minutes, I was seriously activated. Epilogue, as I sat down, laughing and collecting myself, I encountered a small weasel living up in the rocks, not happy that I had stopped near its den. A very aggressive weasel as it turned out. This definitely falls into the strangest category. Was solo pitching for a long weekend in the Pacific Northwest, and one day was in the rare part of the trail that is closer to civilization, so there was a higher chance of other hikers slash campers being around. I saw one or two people but was mostly from afar, and as it was nightfall soon and getting cold and I was getting deeper into the woods I knew the odds of seeing someone else was highly unlikely. I was hiking around a small pond and was going to set up camp nearby when I heard some shuffling noises behind a small boulder slash rock wall type thing. It was a repetitive noise, and got louder and then quieter, but never stopped at all, and basically if you're a regular hiker you know a noise that does not fit the woods when you hear it. I took out my, two, knives that I carry when hiking, and slowly walked around the boulder, honestly not knowing what I would see. What I did not expect, and was very shocked to see, was a very attractive couple in their 20s having very aggressive but happy doggy style sex on a blanket. Obviously they were as shocked as I was to see one another, and they freaked out and yelled, as did I, and as they covered their bodies in their clothes in a panic I awkwardly apologized, picked up all my gear and just sort of jogged off into the woods, passing their tent they had pitched along the way same way I had seen the tent the dude had pitched in his nether regions. Also in another part of the country I thought I saw a bear once and it turned out to be a giant pile of mud. I wonder if that couple is still together, and if tell that story when they get drunk at parties, like I do. I was camping in Northern California like at the very tippy top of California, deep in the woods at a reservoir. I had to go poop really bad early in the morning before the sun was up and there were no bathrooms. So I walked down a trail and found a little spot isolated away from the trail next to a blackberry bush and an outcropping of water from the reservoir. I heard some crashing in the tree line and it just started to become slightly light outside. I peeked over the blackberry bush and not 40 feet from me was a huge bear, around 500 pounds. I tried to sneak away but as I was stepping backwards I kid you not, I stepped on a twig that snapped. This bear and I instantly both turn our heads toward one another and lock eyes. I attempted to make myself look big and make noise. Bear didn't budge. In fact he started to walk towards me. So many things were racing through my mind, the number one being, there is no way I'm curling up into a ball and allowing this monstrously giant bear mess with me, so I crouched down as low as I could behind the blackberry bush so he couldn't see me, and started running as fast as I could whilst crouched slash squatting down. My thought process was that if he couldn't see me run, maybe he wouldn't chase if I was already kind of far away before he actually saw my running over the blackberry bush. It worked. He pursued around the bush for maybe 20 feet and decided it wasn't worth it and allowed my escape. I honestly thought I was going to be breakfast for this bear and that would be the end of me.
Me and a group of 20 others were hiking in a two-person side-to-side line through thick woods at around 1 a.m. We managed to find a muddy road which we continued to walk over for miles before going back into the woods. While walking on the muddy road, I held a conversation with one of my friends that was to the right of me. After a while of talking, I noticed that my group was further ahead of me than before so I picked up the pace. As I got closer, I noticed something odd. The friend I was talking to was already with the rest of my group. I asked him how did he get back so quick and he turned, looked at me and said, I was wondering where you were, you disappeared for a good 5 minutes. Let's just say I didn't feel alright after hearing those words. I know for a fact I was speaking to him earlier, and if not him, then someone exactly the same with all the same gear. Luckily nothing happened after that, but I was pretty shook for the rest of the hiking night. This all happened in Poland when I was a teenager part of what I call survivalist camp TLDR. I went hiking with a group of 20 people, fell behind due to slow pace, thought I was talking to my friend that was next to me but turns out he was with the rest of the group and not with me. Was out with a friend a few miles from Pikes Peak in Colorado. We were hiking on this trail and up ahead I see a blue windbreaker in the middle of the trail. We hadn't seen anybody else out walking all day, it's pretty remote where we were staying, so it was weird it was placed right in the middle of the path, but hey things happen and people drop things so maybe it fell out of a backpack and nobody noticed. The windbreaker was just a piece of this entire campsite we ended up coming across that was absolutely torn to shreds. There was a tent, a hammock, a cooler, and a backpack. Various articles of clothing thrown about as well. The tent had broken poles, was shredded, and looked like it was from the early 2000s with the fading that was apparent and the old style of it. Think of a basic four-person Walmart tent, not a nice fancy lightweight backpacking tent. The hammock was still hanging. Empty. The cooler was open and empty. A few shirts and shorts were scattered and the backpack was empty. We told ourselves it must be some homeless shelter and that was a good enough excuse for us to leave everything how it was and continue back to the cabin we were staying in. I live near Lake of the Woods in northwestern Ontario. This one time a friend and I were mountain biking on a hot August day when we ended up on a trail in the bush where there is an old abandoned car graveyard. Nothing too scary, it's pretty normal for people to scrap their cars in the bush around here so we carry on. Buddy and I are excited to explore the area because there are a lot of interesting vehicles and parts to build jumps with. We ended up sticking around for about an hour or two until dusk was starting to set in when we came across a black 1950 Buick Roadmaster that looked like it got halfway through restoration. That's when we realized that something was sort of off about this place. There were no properties near this spot for miles and it was very strange that someone would abandon such a beautiful car halfway through a repair. My alarm bells were ringing, but only a little so we carried on as we were pretty beat from all the riding we were doing that day. We decided to find a place to rest and walked a little more into the trail towards a small dirt pile when we immediately realized that something was definitely wrong. The place was littered with animal bones from different animals. There were deer skulls, rabbits, dogs and what looked like feline bones. I'm starting to feel a little sick to my stomach, but my buddy seems unfazed by it. I can't tell if he's the braver of the two of us or less intelligent at this point because I keep telling him with increasing urgency that we need to get on our bikes and get the hell out of here. He tells me I shouldn't worry and tries to rationalize it by saying that it was some hunter illegally dumping here, despite the canine bones. He walked to the other side of the dirt pile, turned around ghost white and said we need to get out of here now I managed to peek around and caught a glimpse of what was on the other side. Holy Jesus, someone built a shrine here. At this point I'm screaming inside of my head to leave and I scramble to grab my bike and my backpack. As we're about to pedal off we hear someone shouting hey. To the right of us in the thick. I've never bolted so damn fast out of somewhere in my entire life. I tried to get a glimpse behind me, 
There was an old man in a plaid shirt and blue jean overalls at near the dirt pile with a shovel in his hand shouting at us and gesturing us to come back. When we thought got close enough to the main road, we decided to take a break to catch our breath. My friend and I are soaked with sweat, chugging our water and completely unsure of what we just saw. We sat on the road for about five minutes relieved that nothing became of it and talked about what it might have been. My friend still trying to rationalize it. Suddenly we can hear a loud vroom. My heart skipped a beat. He started the car. We peeled it down the main road to his house in what felt like two minutes for what should have been at least a 10 minute ride. I could feel the lactic acid building up in my legs from pedaling so hard, gears maxed out even going uphill. This was 12 years ago to this day I still don't know what was happening down that trail, but I'm glad I never stayed to find out. I was camping up in Haber, Arizona with my brothers and my dad. I was 15 or so at the time and we were deep in the woods, far from most other camps. Me and my brothers had our own tent whilst my dad had a separate one not far off. He likes to give us our privacy while we were camping. We would usually run around a bit at night before going to bed, entering our camp to sleep at about 11 PM. One night we were playing hide and seek when we heard a branch snap a few yards from us. We assumed it was an elk or something since they were pretty common in our area. We would typically go to our tent if we saw one in hopes of not agitating it. So that's what we did. I called for my youngest brother who was still hiding and he revealed himself to be hiding behind a branch pile not super far from where the noise originated. We went to the tent and I decided since it was already pretty late that we should just go to sleep. The next morning I went to check the spot for elk prints since I found them pretty fascinating. Instead, I found large cat prints. I knew they were cat prints because they had the four toe pads and the large center pad as well as no claw marks. I was honestly kind of excited. I had always wanted to see a mountain lion or a bobcat in the wild but it never happened. Knowing that I was that close to either one was very thrilling. It then occurred to me that my youngest brother was hiding, separated from us scarily close to the paw prints location. It occurred to me that if that was a hungry mountain lion and it had taken notice of my six-year-old brother hiding alone it could have possibly taken the chance. We stopped doing hide and seek at night to avoid those types of situations and we actually set up a roll call system to ensure everyone was together at night. Now I know a mountain lion likely wouldn't have done anything had it seen him but still, the risk felt very real and I worried that had I not heard it I could have lost my brother. Edit. I'm glad my most upvoted post is about an animal that was apparently stalking my brother. That's something I'll forever have on my mind. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail, northern part of southern Oregon, a few years back with my sill. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the Enumqua River and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable. Like someone was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail and up a very small incline. Through the trees I could see a small meadow. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent. An old, canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow. Like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into Sill and whispered, do not not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody not right next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe 10 yards, and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense, 
There is a thick moss cover under the tree so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I learned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did, I did and so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not stop until I told her to. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the damn wind. I just kept telling her, go go go. I could see ahead of us that the trail made an incline and veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was, was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that even though we could no longer hear anyone behind or above us. That section of the trail was about 9 miles and we were not halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother, not my ex, to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east towards home, knowing he'd find us. He did and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained it might be a day or two before they could get in on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we were not crazy or imagining things and someone really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked down at the ground and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, you will never hike anywhere again. What we found was not normal and will not happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again and it completely burnt last year. I also never hiked unarmed, ever again. That was huge for me as I was not a gun person. I had many incidents living up there in a national forest with wild animals and other strange things but nothing ever scared me as much as that day. We basically lived in the woods during quarantine. We'd spend the days there storm or shine, drinking beers, picking up trash, swimming, just goofing around. We also started doing something that sounds odd to say out loud but at the time kept us sane. We'd get to the woods, strip off our socks and shoes, and hike in silence to this little lagoon we'd lay out at. It was insanely meditative and I absolutely loved just barefoot wandering, it felt so satisfying in this primal sort of way. Anyway, the more we roamed like that, the more in tune we got with the woods around us. Without the chatter between us and the careless stomping of booted feet, we'd become part of the woods in this weird way. Probably helped that I was stoned out of my gourd half the time, we'd surprise people pretty often without meaning to, passing within a couple feet before they noticed us. It was like our guts started calling the shots. We could feel storms brewing, all the creatures seemed to stop minding us when we walked like that, so whenever the woods went silent we knew something was coming. It was one of those days, with thick skies and kinda electric air. It had been stormy for a few days and the woods were pretty empty. We'd only seen maybe two other souls all day. Darkness had started to creep in, quicker than usual. We were headed out of the woods, barefoot and knocking back the dregs of some warm, beer, chatting a bit about nothing. I remember we were coming up this hill and all of a sudden it was like I'd swallowed a snowball. I looked up at her and she was frozen mid-laugh. Something was wrong. The woods were. Off. We were surrounded by murky shadows and dead silence. Heavy silence. Tense silence. Then we heard it. It was this metallic sort of sound. A kind of clanging we couldn't really make out. Metal striking stone. Over and over. A bit further down the trail, squarely in between us and the way out. We stood like statues, tucked behind some trees, just listening. A shovel. Someone digging. We crept closer. I remember how the sound made my palms itch. My friend's face was flushed rose red. I told myself I was being stupid. In fact, 
I had in my backpack a little spade we used to plant flowers and dig up rocks and such. Who was I to judge this person? But then again, that was just a little garden spade. And as we got closer it became clear that this person had a full-on shovel and was digging in the middle of the trail. I kept trying to explain it to myself. This person was just digging. Sure, it was dusk and a lightning storm was hastening our way but, we all cope with quarantine differently. And sure, it's odd to carry a big shovel this deep into the woods but maybe they're burying a beloved pet. And sure, it makes no sense that they'd bury their pet in the middle of the trail but maybe they're digging a bike jump. And yeah they don't have a bike but. On and on like that, my mind churning out reasons and still, the knots in my gut wouldn't loosen. We were almost on him now. I think it was AM, though they were wearing a hat, scarf, and heavy clothes. All black, bit odd for summer. But again, he might be in mourning for his sweet Fido, who had loved that spot, in the middle of the narrow dirt trail. With every step, my stomach hurt more. We were both shining in sweat. The sound of metal striking earth and stone seemed deafening. It's a primal sort of fear, isn't it? Rooted deep in our guts, completely deaf to every excuse I was handing it. We were just waltzing along one minute, cracking jokes, slugging beer, and suddenly it was like every neuron was firing, every muscle tight enough to snap. My mind was racing. I was taking stock of everything. Two girls, barefoot, in swimsuits and overalls. Two empty beer cans. I had a bag of found trash and a backpack of random stuff. My friend was holding our bucket of rocks, though we'd pick skinny flat stones for skipping, not self-defense. I had a can of pepper spray buried somewhere in my bag but, much to my mother's dismay I'd bet, couldn't easily access it. And that stupid spade. It feels so insane looking back. I've never been in a fight, I never raise my voice, I spend most of my days talking to toddlers about emotional regulation. And yet, here I suddenly was, tallying up what I had on hand that could be used as a weapon, against a total stranger. But all those excuses I'd fashioned for him had fallen away and only one thought stuck. Maybe this gut feeling is wrong. Maybe he's doing any one of a million things. Maybe he'd feel awkward or embarrassed, seeing us bolt away. But what if it's right? What is the cost if it's right? If we walk past and he swings the shovel, what then? What would the excuses cost us? Something shifted. I didn't know what. It felt like such a high voltage situation, a single spark in a gas choked room. My friend went white, said the first words we'd exchanged the whole time. Don't look at him. Run. We ran. Crashed down into the woods off the trail. Close to the water. We could jump in if he chased us. We sprinted, leaping over boulders, ducking under trees. Thorns and stones sticking into bare soles. I didn't feel them, didn't notice the blood on my feet, till we broke out of the tree line. Later, we tried to piece it together. Tried to understand what had happened. We were cucumber cool ordinarily, and definitely felt a sense of invincibility sneaking round the woods. It was until we were safe home, bandaging our feet that we figured it out, as far as we ever would. The spark had been silence. He had stopped shoveling. And, safe at home, I admitted that I'd looked back. Just a glance, just for a split second. He had stopped shoveling, and started walking towards us. I was out solo hiking in Italy in 2016. It was memorable for two reasons. The first instance was a strange one. I was on a trail to Monte Ferrato a natural stone arch that overlooks coastline giving stunning views of the sea and northern part of the Apuan Alps through it. Anyway, halfway up the trail I meet cross couple descending, I presume to be husband and wife. They were maybe in their fifties. As we get closer to each other I can the male of the couple looking at me in an upset slash flustered manner. I don't think too much of it at first, but as our paths cross this guy stops in front of me and puts his right hand on my shoulder. I could see he was physically shaking, pale he looked really upset. I did not take his approach to be a threat to me in any M way. 
I was just a little bewildered. I know minimal Italian that would be appropriate for this situation, so I just blurt out you okay mate. He did mumble something in Italian. But what I do not know. His wife then put her arms around him and said in broken English something to the effect of it's okay you look like someone he once knew. And with that she pulled her husband away and if they went down the mountainside. It was like the guy had just seen a ghost, obviously I have no idea who I reminded him of. I just hope it was not too upsetting for them. The second instance I think I got an idea of how Legends Fawn's half man half goat came about. This time I was lost, well I was no longer on a designated trail. But knew from my map that if follow this stream downhill I'd cross a road a few miles down and then I'd be back on track. Well almost, this stream turned into a steep rock ravine which then sunk into a sinkhole. Which was a bit too big to get round so back up I went to some high ground to find a better route down. It was doing this I came to a top of a small ridge with an derelict shepherd's hut. The roof of red pan tiles had long collapsed, but the walls were still standing, with a single broken window doorway. Broke still needing to work out a better route to get down I threw my backpack on the ground pulled out my map and against the wall of the hut. Ten minutes must have passed when suddenly I heard something walking over the broken roof tiles inside the hut. Startled I jumped up and stood away from the building. I heard the breaking of tiles underfoot again, but there was a lightness to the sound that told me it possibly was not human feet making this sound. With this thought I gingerly approached the broken window to peer through. To my surprise it was a mountain goat. I let out laugh and with that the goat scarpered out the back of the hut. Intrigued, I went to the back to see where it headed. This goat was super fast, when I got round the back there was this super steep V-shaped valley. It was gone. Or so I thought. On the other side of the incline I saw what I first thought was a, a very muscular man with horns sprinting up the side of the valley. It took my brain more than a moment to work out that the steep incline gave the perspective of the goat running upright in bipedal fashion. If I didn't have the privilege of seeing this mountain goat moments before in the hut. I would have been convinced I just saw some goat man from ancient legend running up the incline. Walking out to a deer blind pre-dawn in the Texas hill country, hunted the same area for 25 years, got the big spook, to the point I drew my pistol and turned on the weapon light, scanning the area around me, Walking backwards at times etc. crawled up in my tree blind and got settled in. But I just could not shake the spook. Sun finally rose and my tension started to ease off. Saw something big and low moving in the brush about 70 yards out but couldn't see it clearly because there were still deep shadows. Little while later I see something weird walking across the center about 150 yards out. I scoped it and the only mountain lion I have ever seen in the wild was very causally crossing the sendera, stopped for a few seconds and I swear looked right at me, then moved along. I stayed up that tree a long long time and I finally came down late in the afternoon while the sun was high and I had been seeing game move around me for a while. About 15 summers ago, I then mid-twenties F, was backpacking the Rogue River scenic area in southern Oregon. That's a heavily forested mountainous area, mixed fir forest, for those of you who don't live around here, and is not an area to be taken lightly. It's the same general location where the Kim family of San Francisco got stuck in the snow and the father died, if you remember that news story. This was June, though, when it's completely safe if you're prepared and know what you're doing. You would not catch me out there in winter. The backpacking route is a trail that runs all along the Rogue River, and there's a few rustic lodges in the area. The lodges get all their supplies by small plane. The trail is steep and in many places it runs along very high cliffs, with the churning, green-blue river down below. If you fell in with a pack on, that would be it for you. People raft the river all the time though. It's an amazing area, Full of wildlife, I saw osprey, eagles, deer up the wazoo, and even a pair of river otters, who were very grumpy about me trying to pump fresh water through my filter right near their den. 
They swam right by me and said something that sounded like the otter version of HMMPPH, then flounced on down the river and out of sight. I have never seen a wild animal create so much drama, before or since, it was also full of ticks, which I could have completely done without. My parents, then in their late fifties but still very active, and my younger brother Nate and I were camping for a night down on one of the sand bars. In the morning, while eating breakfast, we heard the buzzing of one of the small planes taking off as usual. We ate our oatmeal, packed up, and left. About 15 minutes later we came around a bend, and on the other side of the gorge, across the river, there was the wreckage of a small plane on fire. It was maybe about a hundred feet away from us, but across two sets of cliffs and a very wild, deep section of river. There was no way we could get across from where we were. We could see pieces of twisted metal just scattered everywhere, and we could also see what appeared to be the body of a man lying face down. Unconscious or dead, we couldn't tell, due to the distance. However, his arms were down by his sides rather than in front of him, and he was draped face down over a rock. It was fairly clear that he'd been thrown out of the plane and hadn't caught himself in any way. The main body of the plane was behind him and it was completely engulfed in flames. We couldn't see any signs of any other people. As far as we knew, we were the first responders. We were about a mile downstream from the lodge, we'd passed it the previous evening before making camp. My brother and I dropped our packs and started running as fast as we could back upstream toward the lodge, while my parents stayed on scene. I have never been a runner. And I have never wanted to be one so badly in my life. I sprinted as long as I could, then I speed walked until I stopped coughing, then I ran again. Along the way I started bargaining with the good lord, and resolving to get fitter, so I would never have to feel my body fail me like this. My brother and I were yelling back and forth at each other as we went, trying to figure out if the poor guy across the gorge could possibly still be alive. We came to a rafters camp, and I yelled at my brother to keep going while I skidded down the trail toward the rafters. They were getting ready to push off. I shouted to them, do you have a radio? Do you have a transmitter? They had nothing. I told them what we had found and what was going on, in between trying to catch my breath. Just then we heard pounding feet, and I saw a group of people booking it down the trail from the lodge back toward the crash site. My brother came walking back toward me, and told me that he'd met the lodge people running toward him on the trail. Somehow they'd already heard what had happened. The rafters floated off downstream, they would be passing the crash site soon and Nate and I went back down the trail again. Now that we weren't in any hurry, I felt like dragging my feet. In a crisis situation, the worst thing is to feel useless. It tears at you. When we finally got to the bend across from the crash site my parents were still there, but now there was also a volunteer ranger and the lodge owners, all holding their hands to their heads, pulling out their hair, talking on the radio. I didn't want to look at them, they knew the pilot, and their distress was private. My folks told me that the sheriff's boat was on the way up the river from Gold Beach, and there was nothing more we could do. We got our packs and hightailed it down the trail. Later, we found out that the volunteer ranger had seen the plane go down and radioed to the sheriff. Both the sheriff and the rafters I'd met, who had been able to climb the opposite cliff, responded to the crash site. But there was nothing they could do. If I remember right, it was eventually determined that the pilot had clipped a tree with the wing of his plane on takeoff. He had a ton of experience, but I guess even experienced pilots can make fatal mistakes. The pilot's wife was also on board. They'd been giving a ride, just for fun, to two women who were staying at the lodge. The pilot and all three passengers were killed. I hope they died on impact, and not in the fire. That day, by common consent, we hiked the remaining 12 miles out to our car. We had planned to camp one more night, but no one wanted to stay in the wilderness any longer. Exhausted, we stumbled more or less silently across meadows, along cliffs, then through fields with gates at the edge of the wilderness, to reach our car. We drove to the nearest town in something like silence. We sat at the restaurant and ordered some hamburgers. My dad ordered a beer. It came. It was, no, 
rogue dead guy ale. Nobody laughed. Following stories are short stories gathered from Native American tribes. I hope that you'll enjoy them. Best regards, Horror Den of Misfits. I'm Cherokee, so technically Native American speaker. Very technical. However, that has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about. That was just obligatory. Maybe it's not appropriate, but maybe it is for this Reddit question, I don't know for sure. I'm Hawaiian living on the island of Kauai. I've met people on here who've said Hawaiians are Native American because America controls Hawaii. Sure buddy. Anyway, there's a lot of supernatural and myth here in Hawaii that I thought I might share a bit of. At least the most prevalent kind that I've heard of. Night marchers. Ghostly ancient Hawaiian warriors. You'll hear drums and see torches when they're near. You can't look at them and you should lie on the ground in respect, they'll kill you otherwise. You still can die even if you follow the recommendations. You're most likely to live if you're of Hawaiian descent, if a ghost warrior is a relative, he can call upon the night marchers to spare a descendant's life, and or show absolute respect. Mermaid of Wailua River She's very much like a siren of sorts. Wailua River is the biggest, in terms of width, on Kauai. She swims in that river and does what one would expect a siren to do. White Man of Waimea Canyon. Basically a small powder white creature that, at night, stalks people. The only story I've heard of it involved the creature jumping on a guy's back and attacking him. Some sort of night creature I forgot the name of. I think it was a sort of one-eyed beast, but I'm not sure. Mythology story of it involved a hunter who stayed out too late so he decided to camp. He sets up a fire and sees the creature across from him. The monster just watches him from across the campfire. This particular monster doesn't like light. The hunter had to sit there and keep the flame lit until morning. When the sun began to rise, the monster left. General ghosts of people that haunt high owls and grave sites. Hayaus are sacred ancient Hawaiian lands that people cannot tread upon. This is a real rule here. Legends ranging from bad luck, being haunted and more can happen if one treads on sacred land. Especially without respect and Hawaiian descent. My uncle once parked by a river in a hotel with a courtyard that was built upon an ancient gravesite. On that courtyard was a tree. My uncle said he saw people in that tree staring back at him. Anyway those are just stories at the top of my head. There is a ton of Hawaiian mythology and I'm glad I was able to share some of that. Even if this wasn't exactly a Native American story. My tribe talks about a beast called, rough translation here. The flame walker. Spirits who take the form of a small blue flame that leads people into the swamps and bogs, where they eventually drown or otherwise vanish. Yes, they are basically will-o'-wisps, another are the water-faced hunters, again rough translation, and I am not heavily involved with my tribe these days. These creatures have a face that acts like a pool of water, reflecting the face of anyone who looks them in the eyes. They mercilessly hunt down the people who acknowledge them. The only way to avoid them is to not speak to, or others interact with a stranger unless you can see their face from the corner of your eye. We also have the more traditional skinwalker type legends, as well the bog men. My tribe is considered part of the Abenaki, but are actually a smaller sub-tribe basically when it came down to it, there were not enough of the tribe to actually be considered a tribe anymore. Today we number fewer than 200 and only eight of those are more than half-blooded. My bio-father and his brother, as well as my paternal grandparents are the last four full-blooded of my tribe. I'm Australian Aboriginal and both my parents were raised in the bush and on their tribal lands. The reason I mention this is because I grew up being told stories and culture for aunts and uncles. 
We have the same thing as the flame walker except we call them Min Min lights, what they're called around the east coast of Australian, but different tribes slash nations in different parts of the county have different names for them. In my culture they are bad spirits. They're like a dancing light slash blue white flame and it dances around and does the exact same thing, tries to get you to follow it and then disappear, leading you to get lost and die. Quite often there will be more than one, like a few just dancing around. I've been told ever since I can remember to never follow any light that's trying to get your attention. I've only ever seen them once and weird things followed after that, but the lights were incomparable to any light I've seen before. Dean from Northern British Columbia here, my mom used to always tell me stories of the Ngani, or Bushmen slash wild men when I was young, they were people who lived in the forest and took away people who wandered too far out, specifically children. I always figured these stories were created by my people to serve two purposes, first to teach young children to not wander far off, and second to give explanations to kidnappings done by other tribes, which was a fairly common occurrence even up until the early to mid 20th century. My grandmother's brother was taken by Cree from Alberta and raised by them. They had assumed he had died until decades later when they were reunited and learned what had happened. Long ago when the people were young, the chiefs of the many clans of the Osage sought out different animals to become symbols of their people, to impart wisdom and strength to them. The chief of the isolated earth, troubled because he had yet to find such an animal, went out hunting for food and a quest for his people's symbol. After he had been hunting for some time, he came across the hoof print of a massive stag. Ah, he said, Grandfather dear, reveal yourself to me, so that you may bring your strength to my people, and began to track the stag so that he could take it as a symbol. For many hours he tracked the stag, and gradually the tracks became fresher as he started to catch up. However, he was so focused on following the tracks of the stag that he did not lift his eyes from the ground, and did not notice that his path would lead him directly into a spider's web. The web was massive and strong, and the chief was caught just enough to impede his passage for a moment. In anger, he struck at the spider, but it dodged his blow and scurried out of reach before proceeding to scold him. Grandson, said the spider, why do you strike at me when it is your own carelessness that has caused you to walk into my web? What has you so preoccupied that you cannot watch where you are going? Why do you walk as a blind man? The chief of the isolated earth suddenly felt foolish, but felt compelled to answer the spider. I was following the tracks of a great stag, so that it can be a symbol of my clan and bring strength to our people. The spider replied that it could be such a symbol, and the chief scoffed at it, you are such a small, weak thing. How could you bring strength to my people? The spider answered where I am, I build my home, and where I build my home all things come to it. Should your people learn this patience, they shall become strong indeed. The chief saw the wisdom of this, and went home, satisfied. And so the medicine spider became a symbol for the isolated earth and one of the symbols of the Osage people. Traditionally, the medicine spider is depicted as a stylized black widow. My Native American tribe has a story about the raven. In the beginning there was no light in the world, because an old magician kept it hidden in a box inside his house. Raven, who was always hungry, didn't like the darkness because it was difficult to find food. One day he was looking for food near the old magician's house. He heard a voice saying, I have a box, and inside this box is another box, and inside this there is another box, and inside the smallest box is all the light in the world. Raven decided to steal the light. Raven waited until the old man's daughter went down to the river to collect water. Just as she was dipping her basket into the river, he changed himself into a hemlock needle. The needle floated into her basket. When the girl drank some water, she swallowed Raven too. 
Inside the girl's belly Raven took the form of a human baby. He grew and grew, and in time she gave birth to a funny-looking child with black eyes and a big nose. The old man loved his grandson so much that he gave in to the child's every wish. Raven became spoilt and greedy. He was bored with all his toys, and wanted to play with the box that held the light. Finally the grandfather opened the box and tossed the glowing ball of light to Raven. As soon as Raven caught the light, he immediately changed into his bird form. Holding the light in his beak, he flew up the chimney hole into the dark world. The magician was angry. He wanted to get the light back into his box. He flew after Raven. The light was heavy in Raven's beak, and he was getting tired. The magician was coming closer. Raven broke off some pieces of the light and threw them into the sky. They became the stars. The magician was still coming closer, so Raven broke off another piece of the light and threw it into the sky. It became the moon. Finally Raven became so tired that he tossed the last and biggest piece of the light into the sky. It became the sun, and that is how daylight came to the world. We have a spirit similar in Aboriginal culture. It's called a Mimi spirit. Basically when you go walk about this spirit, day or night, will try and trick you into following it. It will appear, you walk to it and it's vanished. It will appear again, you again follow it for it to disappear. Repeat this multiple times and you are lost forever. I was seven when I first actually met an elder whose son was taken by the Mimi spirit. They'll never forget her broken face when she told my class. I'm from Haudenosaunee Native American tribe. I don't really know any actual stories well enough to tell, but I know the rules. If you hear someone you know calling your name, but you also know they are not supposed to be there, don't respond. Especially if they are out of sight and insisting you come to them. Also, always play group games in counterclockwise order, otherwise you're playing with the dead. 3. Don't eat in the dark, this is considered inviting the dead to eat with you. If you can extend your hand all the way out and still see it clearly then you're fine. 4. Don't play card games past midnight. If you do, and someone knocks at the door, don't answer it. Try not to drop your cards. If you do then don't bend down to pick them up, or you will see hooves under the table. That's bad. 5. Say thank you after meals, even if you're the one that made it. Even better if you say it in native tongue. If someone finishes their meal and says, thank you, you say you're welcome, even if you didn't give it to them. Even better in native tongue. 6. Don't try to contact spirits, especially with board games. This is not a tribe custom, it's more of an unspoken common sense among the res people. 7. After someone dies, you should gather family as quickly as possible to have feasts for 10 days. The first dinner is large, then every meal after that is smaller feasts meant for portions of the family to come at different times to help. The last feast on the 10 day is the closing dinner, which is the largest, with the entire family expected to show up and help. For every meal of these 10 days, put out a plate of the deceased's favorite foods first. Contrary to rule 4, you do not say thank you at any time during these 10 days. This is because it is believed that it takes the dead 10 days to relive their lives before they pass on, so this is your last chance to eat with them. 8. If a bird flies into your house, someone's going to die. Yamoria and Yamoa the giant twins. Now I can't honestly remember too many stories on these brothers. But there are landmarks all around the territory I live in that is exhibited as proof they were alive. In the middle of the Mackenzie River biggest river in the NWT, there is a large stone sticking out of the river which looks like the petrified guts of a beaver, there is a giant branchless, leafless tree sticking out of the top of this stone. 
It is said that Jamoa had hunted a giant beaver and gutted him there in the river. He used his spear to anchor down the cut so fish may feed on them. They are still there to this day. Yamoria's body can be seen laying down, it is essentially a mountain range that looks like a giant human laying on his back, completely with face and feet. This can be seen from the peak of the hill as you enter a town called Ft. Liar, the southwesternmost town in the NWT. There is a lot more about these two brothers but I'll have to ask my dad but I'm away at work for now. I'm Tsmshin and we seem to have a lot of shapeshifters which some are, uh, questionable. I think a lot of them are similar to the idea of skinwalkers, but some of the shapeshifters, like Raven, have been a huge part of getting the things we need like the moon and stars, although mostly through trickery. I've known some people who swear they've come into contact with shapeshifters that usually end up being like a mimic of someone they know, usually something with them, but are often faceless. There was apparently a ghost war once. Mosquitoes were once a bloodthirsty group of people. So I know we have the Apache Death Cave. That's actually real though, but it's a great read for people looking for ghost stories. I was told a story by my great-grandmother. A mountain spirit was angry about the way that white men had hurt the land, by breaking the mountains and tainting the waters, so he came up with a plan. He pretended to be a white man, and convinced people he had found a mine. Every day he would appear to be growing richer and richer. Finally, the white men grew greedy and decided to take the mine for themselves, followed the spirit into the mountain. Every day, men would try to follow the spirit into the mountains, but none ever returned. This continued every day, because the white men cared more about the copper than the mountains, lands, and water. It is still happening even today. The spirit takes their bodies somewhere they can never return to the land they abused. I'm Cherokee, and my family has always had supernatural things going on. Though there are lots of cool scary stories to tell, one in particular popped up in my head when I read the question. The Deer Woman. My stepmom always said she was Deer Clan, because of this she never ate any deer whatsoever. I never knew the reason why till after she became extremely ill because my dad tricked her into eating deer jerky one day. She told me that anyone who ate deer in her clan usually gets a warning by getting sick, but if they continued eating deer they would die. This is because the deer woman would come for them, because they had done wrong. Then she went further down the road of making me not eat any jerky for a while by saying, every year a person in her clan is taken by the deer woman. This is at powwows of course, when everyone goes home. You'll hear the next day that someone turned up dead, or went missing never to be found, is what she told me in between moments of dizziness. I was around seven or eight at the time, and her being my stepmom, I thought I was going to die because all I ate was deer jerky that day. Do Inuit count? I'm from the northern Canada, Nunavut, there are shadow figures called Terranak or the shadow people. It is believed that you can see them from the corner of your eyesight. When you see a Terranak, you would take another look or you swore you saw something in a form of shadow or a haze. I have heard that they are rather creepy and they give you the feeling of being watched or a slight anxious of some is following you. Another legend is called I Gerate, translated people who hide. I gerate are entities that you would see in the barren Arctic in the far hills. The I gerate have the power to shapeshift into other creatures or people, really similar to the Navajo legend Skinwalker although never harming Inuit. It is believed that the entities observes Inuit and follow them but I have never heard I gerate harming Inuit. An Enoch elder explained that the I gerate can live human lives or imitating humans, or even marry other human beings, while pretending to be Inuit. 
Camping in the Arctic is creepy and you would have that expectation that you would encounter entities especially how the Arctic is so vast and empty. Mexican here. We were tribesmen too, we just built a bit of an empire, so I'll tell you the story of the Shinek. These creeps are young children with the faces of old men and not much is known about them. They live in the deserts and jungles of Mexico and the legend goes that if you see one and follow it, you'll lose either three or seven days. My grandfather always told me that if you lose seven days to a Shinek, they follow you home and they try their absolute best to drive you to insanity, depression, or suicide. If you lose three days, it means one of two things will happen. The first is that you'll go to war where you will die a brutal but glorious death. The second is that you will be the victim of great tragedy. Lose your life savings, break both legs, lose family. That sort of thing. If you turn your back on the Shinek, it will transform into a great and terrible jaguar and you'll be devoured. To avoid this fate, you must back away from it, avoiding eye contact at all costs, for if you make eye contact, it will steal your soul. When you can no longer see it, you must pray and pray hard. I'm not quite sure how well this monster is known throughout Mexico or if it's even told the same. But I know that this story has been in my family for generations. My grandfather's grandfather told him. My father's grandfather told him. My grandfather told me. My father will tell my son. And I'll tell my grandson. Yes, in that order. Old traditions, I pray we never see one of these monsters. Edit, I'm Aztec, by the way. Or Mexica, if you care to split hairs. I'm Matis and an interesting fact that I learned recently was that out in the West when they went on long buffalo hunts and someone died, it was necessary to bring them back to their home community. So let's just say that Grandpa Jean Baptiste dies on the hunt. They would bury him in a shallow grave with a marker and when the hunt was over they would dig him up, put him under all the hides so the smell of dead Grandpa Jean Baptiste wouldn't be too bad and they would bring them back to their homeland and give him a proper burial. It was important to them that their dead came back home and were laid to rest with the rest of the family. A lot of them were very Catholic and firmly believed that the dead must be buried on sacred ground or else their souls would wander restlessly. Apparently European settlers and First Nations did not follow this practice. They would bury them where they died. I'm Anishinaab, Ojibwe slash Chippewa. When I was young, my mom would tell me and my siblings stories. One of them was about twisted, spiteful people, people who were knowledgeable about medicine, spiritual power, but that they used it in a bad way. It was said that such people could turn into bears, shapeshifters. We called them bear walkers, and they moved only at night. Weird wolf guy mentioned willow wisps, and his story is similar to mine. We were taught that these balls of light were the sign of a bear walker. And that if we saw one, we were supposed to run away, as fast as we could. I'm half and half, half Apache and half Cherokee. I know plenty of lore but I have a story about coyotes and shapeshifting that I personally experienced if anybody is interested in hearing it. Edit, alright, it's maybe not the most exciting but here it is. I was living on the res and I was way out in the middle of nowhere, even in res standards. It was night time and I was watching the full moon outside, I remember it was so beautifully bright that I could see almost everything. It wasn't uncommon to hear coyotes around here, though you saw them less than you heard them. In spite of this, I saw a few coyotes trotting off a little ways in an opening bathed in the full moon. I remember thinking that they must be up to no good, because coyote is rarely up to any good. Oddly, I didn't hear them, even though coyotes are louder and more talkative when traveling at night. Well, I was gazing out the window near our front door 
when I heard my mother calling me from outside. I specifically remember that she said I had left my backpack in the car and needed to get it to do my homework. I thought nothing of it and began to put on my shoes. Suddenly, every hair on my body stood straight up. The air seemed wrong. It was at this time that my mother walked in from the kitchen and said that dinner was almost ready and I needed to wash up. She saw my shoes on, and immediately sensed something wasn't right. She asked if somebody was outside. I said she was. Of course, no she wasn't. She had been in the kitchen the whole time. I took a last look out the window facing the open field, and I saw a coyote waiting in the light of the full moon. It then stood up on its hind legs like a person and walked into the woods. I would stake my life on this story's authenticity. This is also not the only story I have of my parents' voices speaking to me while I'm alone. I come from the Lumbee tribe, which has a lot of controversy to begin with but I'll share a family story. My great-grandmother was supposedly the local witch doctor in her town for a majority of her life. Growing up, I always thought these sorta of stories were total BS and just my dad messing with me. He and his family would always say how I was her namesake and even if I didn't want to accept it, we had some weird synchronicities in our family and assumed it was because of her. The day she passed away, my dad was out in his garden when he immediately stood up and thought he heard her screaming from afar. At the time, he lived in a separate state from her but the screaming sounded like her voice and it really freaked him out. He goes inside the house to call and check on her when suddenly the phone rings. It's his mother telling him how his grandmother had just passed away and he needs to head home. Another weird thing in our family is that whenever I have a dream with my dad in it, even if he only appears for a brief second, without failure he calls me the next day. Every goddamn time this man is in my dreams, I wake up and know that he'll be calling me sometime that day. Best part? He says the same things happens when I appear in his dreams. Him and I aren't terribly close in the sense that I haven't seen him in person in two years and we maybe chat on the phone once a month or so. Granted it's nothing too spooky, but I always found it really interesting that his family and I have these minor happenings and we usually just chalk it up to being lumby ha. Navajo here. Now that I think about it I haven't heard that many stories. Like it's been said, we don't talk about it. It's a way to avoid them crossing your path. But I do have a story from my grandmother, who helped my grandfather with medicine men practices. So she knew a lot of Navajos in the city, we don't live on the res, and there was one lady that she refused to talk to. Even now, she gets angry about sharing any connection to their family and her grandchildren. From what I was told she could travel faster than what should be possible, and could travel what would be 8 hours to about an hour. She also didn't seem to age. Her sister also warned other natives about her, and not to converse with her as she could witch them with disease and misfortune. I've always heard that they're like a mafia, and that if you aren't part of them then you wouldn't know what they do. But pretty much nothing good can come with an encounter with one of them. I'm only part Native American, but mostly grew up as a white kid in a white family in rural Central Texas. Local legends seem to be a blend of Native American, Hispanic, and white American and I think they're super interesting. The legends aren't told as much anymore. Only older folk talk about them and no children remember them anymore. I fear they're dying, so here they are. The Duke and Duchess of Harvest are a pair of spirits who protect crops from damage. They're benevolent spirits who do their best to help everybody, but can't always do it all, so, you have to do your part in protecting your own crops and helping out your neighbors too so they can help others in greater need. They're honored at the yearly Harvest Festival, with the Duke and Duchess being named from each grade at the local elementary school. The Snatcher, or El Tomador, is an evil spirit who snatches away children and animals that wander too far from their parents. No one has ever seen it. 
The old spirits are a poorly defined group of neutral spirits that just sort of wander around at night. They're the guardians of nature at night, humans get the daytime, the old spirits get the nighttime. Their disapproving looks if you're out during darkness give you uneasy feelings. The pumpkin men are human bodies with pumpkin heads that wander vegetable patches at night and either protect the garden or spread disease in them, depending on who you talk to. El Chupacabra exists in many cultures, I don't think there's a big need to talk about it here. This is all I can think of right now. Apsa look here. I see a lot of other tribes with similar stories regarding little people and Bigfoot. We also have a local legend of the goat man. From what I know, this particular spirit slash demon slash creature has only been a recent phenomenon. Maybe started to appear in the last 20 years? Anyway, there is man who has the upper body of an adult male, but the lower body of a goat. He likes to hitchhike and get in vehicles and tries to steal children. A lot of sightings near the Lodge Grass slash Benteen area and also in the Busby area as well. We also have the story of the witch who lives in the Prior Mountains south of Billings, who helps you with your life's problems, but first must take a finger as payment. I will ask my Kale, grandmother, for more. Walking Sam skulks in the shadows of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota and convinces people to commit suicide, especially young people. He's seven feet tall, very thin and has no mouth. When he stretches out his long arms, nooses hang down with Lakota children hanging from them. Walking Sam finds you when you're alone and puts thoughts in your head until you feel worthless and kill yourself. Sometimes Walking Sam is depicted looking like Abraham Lincoln, complete with the stovepipe hat. Walking Sam, Uncle Sam, I don't know if that's where the name came from. But Walking Sam is an evil infected upon the people when the Osity Sakuin were forced onto the reservations. He isn't a legend of the people before Pine Ridge Reservation existed. Lincoln was president when the Lakota were being forced onto reservations. Lincoln also ordered the execution of 38 Lakota men the day after Christmas in 1862. It's the largest mass execution in U.S. history. I always thought Walking Sam was Lincoln. They carved his face onto Shakpe Tukasi in the Pahasapa, Mount Rushmore with six grandfathers in the Black Hills. My father attended Holy Rosary boarding school at Pine Ridge in the 1940s and 1950s, but our people didn't live on the reservation. My grandmother said evil stalked the people there. My father never wanted us to ever even visit any of our cousins or his uncles there. A Lakota story is the man with no face, he's like a boogeyman. The story goes that long time ago in a village, there was this very handsome young man. Many girls from different tribes wanted to be with him and because of that he grew up to be very obnoxious. He became so ignorant that he would make fun of this old medicine man. Calling him ugly whenever he got the chance, one day the old man said, before I leave die, I will take your face as my own. You will forever wander looking for it. The young man laughed and called the old man foolish. Within the next few weeks, the old man dies and fulfills his promise. When the young man woke up he couldn't see or anything. When he reaches to feel his face, he feels nothing but smooth skin where his face would be. Yelling but no one hears him, soon the village finds out and chases him off. He now roams the prairie looking for a replacement face. My uncle once told me that he heard this man speak in a ceremony, while it's not good to talk about what goes on in them. I can say this much. The man with no face told everyone that when you're growing up and your parents or grandparents tell you to stay under a meter light or else you're open for him to take you. Also, we're told no to whistle at night because it calls spirits, he is one of them and he looks at it as an invite to take your face if it suits him or he'll take you with him as he does to anyone that breaks these rules. 
Now I always break the latter rule and take my chances. But never know till it happens to you. Here's one from my tribe, in the traditions of many Salish and other Northwest Indian tribes, stick Indians are malevolent and extremely dangerous forest spirits. Details about stick Indians vary from tribe to tribe, they are described as large, hairy Bigfoot-like creatures by the Salish, and as forest dwarves by the Cayuse and Yakama, in some traditions stick Indians have powers to paralyze, hypnotize, or cause insanity in hapless humans while in others, they merely lead people astray by making eerie sounds of whistling or laughter in the woods at night. In some stories stick Indians may eat people who fall prey to them, kidnap children, or molest women. They also take aggressive revenge against people who injure or disrespect them, no matter how unintentionally. Not too many traditional legends regarding stick Indians have been recorded, in part due to taboos related to these deadly creatures. Stick Indians is an English euphemism, saying the actual Salish names of these beings in public is considered to be provoking their attacks in some tribes, a belief many native people still adhere to today, choosing to refer to them only in English, if at all. The legend of the Mohegan tribe, Uncasville, Connecticut, and the Whippoorwill Moccasins is interesting. The rocks of Mohegan Hill are the home of the Makiwai Sug, or little people. After nightfall, the call of the whippoorwill signals their arrival. They are good spirits, but the Mohegans know they must be treated with respect, according to tradition. It is important to leave baskets of food, such as corn cakes and berries, or even meat in the woods for them. Wearing moccasin flowers for shoes, they gather the gifts at night. In fact, Makiwai Sug means whippoorwill moccasins. They have their own rules of etiquette. Those who see the little people should not look directly at them, they think it's rude. If they catch you staring, they might point a finger at you, rooting you to the ground, while they take your belongings. Another rule is don't speak of them in the summer, when they are most active. But in return for kindness, they taught the Mohegan people how to grow corn and use healing plants. They keep the earth well and grant favors for those who honor their ways. When the English settlers came and disrupted the traditional way of Mohegan life, many forgot to help the Makiwai Sug. As a result, many Mohegans and Makiwai Sug fell ill. At this time of bad spirits, there lived a medicine woman. One night, during a terrible storm, she heard the whippoorwill. When she looked outside, the bird wasn't to be found but a small boy stood in the rain on her doorstep. It turned out he was a grown Makiwai Sug named Wee Gun, who told her to come help someone who was sick. Though the storm was fierce, he led her through the woods a long way. Suddenly, the storm seemed to stop as they began to descend into the ground. They were in the realm of the little people. Wee Gun led her to a beehive-shaped chamber of rocks. Inside, a very old woman lay in bed, very ill. The Makiwai Sug told the medicine woman that this was Granny Squanet, who must be made well. Granny Squanet is very powerful, and she is known to cause storms when she argues with her husband. Her illness was the reason for this storm. Worse, healers often look to Granny Squanet when the need is dire for help in healing, and here she was the one who was sick. The medicine woman treated Granny Squanet for nearly a moon before she got better. In return for restoring Granny Squanet's health, the Makiwai Sug gave the medicine woman a basket of gifts and told her to remember them. She was blindfolded and taken back home. Only when she returned did she open the basket. Inside were quartz crystals, painted skins and bunches of herbs. I am indigenous and can share a couple lesser known stories. In my culture the best time to tell stories is when there is someone who wants to listen, and we love to share our stories with other cultures. A brief one you may be able to use IRL, the bird Parasaurus canadensis, is also known as the Grey Jay, Canada Jay, Whiskey Jack, Wisakijik, Wizajichok. 
It is a trickster like Coyote. But it is a fair minded trickster, who enjoys human company, and isn't as inclined to mess with a person who doesn't bring it on themselves. When you see it in a park or forest, take a small food item like a chunk of bread and hold it in your outstretched palm. Even a wild one of these trickster birds will often come land on your hand and take the treat. In return the bird will put a smile on your face. A longer one, but also practical, we live in a crowded world, overlapping with other worlds stacked upon each other. Sometimes you will get a glimpse of the people and creatures of these other worlds. Children who have not been taught to distrust what they see will notice them, as do animals like your dog or cat. When you feel you aren't alone, or think you see movement in the corner of your eye, do not turn your head. The sides of your eyes cannot see colors, retinal rods versus cones, but can see a wider spectrum and in lower light. Instead of turning your head, look off to the side of what you sense, and you will be more likely to see who or what is there. Practice hones this skill, and soon, if you are lucky, you will be able to clearly see how crowded our world is. Later, if you are even luckier, you will be able to learn to unsee how crowded this world is. Black Cats The black cat of legends and fables that is a harbinger of bad luck is not a physical cat, Felis Catus. It is a non-physical creature drawn by the energy of times of change, and only means bad luck if you are foolish when times are chaotic. The true black cat will be seen to be darting around nearby, and will look like a blurry black shape or shadow, moving quickly, low to the ground, and about twice the size of a house cat. The more chaotic the times, the closer they will get, and the more visible they will become. If they cross your path or you see more than one in a short time, choose your words and actions carefully, and subject potential decisions to extra scrutiny. In and around the area I grew up in as a kid is a place called the Nahani River Valley. Other names for it exist but the most interesting is the Headless Valley. It is called the Headless Valley due to a lot of stories existing of people who go in and don't come out, any bodies being found without their heads. That fact is more well known than the creature the local Dean people believe to be behind these killings, Waila. It is described as a giant red-eyed wolf solid red, not like from albinism, that has territorialized the valley. Legend says that it kills any lone hunters entering the valley, that you should avoid it without a partner, and that any who do not pay respect to the land will have their heads snapped of by the wolf. A lot of people do kayaking trips down it as a part of local tourism. Nanti Anak from Aleutiak is neat. All of the legends of Portlock, or Port Chatham, of Alaska are fascinating. Discovery Channel, unfortunately, got a hold of it recently and bastardized the history. They play it up as Bigfoot. But if you talk to native speakers, it's tied to an evil shapeshifter. Nanti Anak means hairy man, but it also means outcast. Supposedly a man in the tribe was shunned and morphed into a horrible beast, many people were mutilated and simply vanished, and bad things plagued the people, ultimately resulting in an entire community fleeing the town in real life. There's some story of a wailing woman in a black dress as well, and a haggard old man with a bushy white beard, both related to Nanti Anak. Not native but I grew up next to a reservation and lived in a community that was mostly natives who chose not to live in the reservation. They a legend of a deer woman, for the life of me I can't remember what they called her, but she had the upper body of a beautiful woman and the legs and feet of a deer. She appears during night powwows and never stops dancing along the outer rings of the fire, where the light is dim so people won't notice her feet and will only see her beautiful face. She will dance all night and catch the eye of many men and try to get one of them away from the powwow, she prefers married men. As she dances she'll kiss men and offer them some adult time. If she gets a man to go with her, she takes him into or near the woods and tramples him to death with her dear feet and eats some of him. 
But if a woman notices her dear feet before she takes a man then the dear woman is forced to give the woman a gift. I'm a Mohawk. Here's our creation horror story. Basically before there was the earth as we know it, the entire planet was water, and so only water creatures inhabited this world. There were beings who lived above or in the clouds, called the thunder beings. One day the chief of the thunder beings has a giant tree uprooted, clearing a path to the water world below. The chief has his wife, Eo is pregnant with his child, peer over the side and, one way or another, some say she fell, some say he pushed her, she ends up falling to the water world below. Now some geese see this woman falling, and decide to rescue her. They flock underneath her, catch her on their backs and lay her on the back of a giant turtle. The other animals, curious at this new creature from the sky, all climb onto the turtle's back. The woman comes too, and the animals explain there is no land in this world. The loon claims to have once seen land at the very bottom of the water, and so animals take turns diving to the bottom. The otter, and duck, the goose all fail, along with all the rest. Finally, the little muskrat takes his dive, and is gone a long time. Soon the bubbles stop, and the animals know his fate. The muskrat floats back to the surface, and clenched in his paw is the tiniest bit of dirt. Skywoman takes the dirt, places it on the turtle's back and begins to dance it out. She circle dances for a seemingly endless amount of time, stretching the earth and turning the turtle into Turtle Island. The animals assist Skywoman in building a home, and she gives birth to a daughter. Now Skywoman and her daughter live peacefully in this new world, until one day the Dautet becomes impregnated by the north wind, he comes to her in the night and places two arrows by her side, one is straight and sharp, the other bent and dull. The daughter, now pregnant with twins, knew they were no ordinary children as her pregnancy advanced fast and she could hear and fettle the twins bickering. Soon the two had a fateful argument, one twin, the right-handed twin, insisted on being born the proper way, by following the light. He did so, and was birthed naturally. The left-handed twin, refusing to follow his brother's lead, instead made his own way out, killing his mother. Most accounts have him emerging from his mother's ribs. Now Skywoman, who had gone to fetch water, returned to find her daughter dead and two baby boys. She demanded to know who had done this to her daughter, and the left-handed twin, Flint, of course blamed his brother. So Skywoman flung the right-handed twin, Skyholder, into the forest. Now the twins grew, Flint with his grandmother and Skyholder by himself. It did not take long for Skyholder to realize his extraordinary powers, indeed he had the power of creation. Skyholder created roses, all flowers and good medicines, forest animals and creatures, he created trees and mountains and valleys. Flint became jealous of his brother, and tried to create as well, though he was much more destructive. Flint created bad medicines, thorns and prickles, snakes, bats, wolves and all sorts of monsters. Skyholder, annoyed with his brother's interference, separated the world in two. Flint grew angry, as all the good game was on Skyholder's island, and so he created an ice bridge across the water. He confronted Skyholder, and the two fought. Eventually Skyholder was victorious, and so he banished his brother to the night. As punishment for abandoning him as an infant, Skyholder ripped off his grandmother's head and threw it into the sky to become the moon, forever to watch over Flint. Like I say, an incredibly abridged version. There are a slew of stories about Flint and Skyholder, and a plethora of details that I skimmed over, but there's the basic gist. I never believed in ghosts or spirits before. I always enjoyed reading about scary stories but I was always a skeptic. But after today, I can confidently say that I do believe in spirits and in evil. After speaking to my dad about this incident with my two younger brothers, 
He's convinced me to write about our story and post it onto Reddit for, hopefully, some answers. I'm sorry if this is poorly written but I'm trying to vent about the occurrence while it's still fresh in my mind. It happened about two hours ago. My family and I are actually currently on a road trip from Florida to Wyoming. Today, however, we decided to set up camp at a secluded, backwooded RV camp in the wilderness by a lake. Only one other RV was parked here and it was all the way on the opposite side of the lake. When we first got here, we were looking around at the area and I immediately noticed the beautiful rocks and minerals all over the place. There were so many. I then noticed a picture-perfect bundle of wheat lying on the ground. I looked online at what it is called, and it says it is called a sheaf. Well, I thought it looked nice and my dad told me to keep it and put it in the RV as a keepsake. About three minutes later, my youngest brother, Joe, 12, came to me and told me that he found some bones by a tree. I was immediately concerned and followed him to the bones. Sure enough, there was a bone about the size of my forearm that looked a lot like a dog bone out of a cartoon and a couple of other skull-like bones, not human skull, beside it. Mind you, these bones were in no particular formation just in a pile. It didn't look as if it was a complete set of bones. And they were not human bones. At least not that I know of. I'd also like to add that the bones had no sort of remains on them. Just bone. My other brother, John, 13, then came over to us and noticed the bones as well. It was extremely creepy. I had walked away and so did Joe but while we were gone, John moved one of the bones around with his shoe which immediately worried me. We left the area and began to just relax with family for a while. We also took a trail behind where the RV was parked. It was a nice half mile trail but very much in the wilderness. Later, we noticed that the sun was setting and the fireflies were coming out so we decided to take the trail once again but this time at sunset. We were having a great time and finally came to the point where we have to choose to take a left, right or continue forward. We were standing there for at least a minute discussing what we should do. I had a bad feeling and told my brothers, I really don't want to continue forward or walk to the right. It's an unknown area that we haven't done. Joe replied, yeah. John was spinning in a circle for fun. We then heard a noise like a screech. Joe said quietly, what was that? Not even five seconds went by and we then heard a screech like growl. It was not a human sound. Joe immediately bolted back to the RV and shouted, run. And me and John stood there two more seconds as we both saw with our own eyes a figure about six tall, a wide build, and something in front of it which looked like a claw. A claw the size of a human head. I described it as the ends of a Native American's feather crown on their head. It was Edward Scissorhands like. Anyway, the thing seemed to be gliding or riding something up the hill to the right where I didn't want to go in the grass on the hill. It looked like a black shadow. Mind you, all of this happened literally within a 10 seconds time span. From the first growl to the second and to the figure moving. John and I immediately bolted behind Joe back to the RV. I have never been so afraid for my life. I ran like the wind. So fast that I thought I'd die from tripping down the hill. As we're running back, John is shouting at me, that was probably just dad. It's just dad I kept yelling no it wasn't and cussing like crazy out of fear. We arrived to the RV and the first person we saw was my dad. The figure wasn't my dad. We hysterically were laughing and breathing. We were laughing because we couldn't believe we were alive and made it back to the RV and couldn't believe what we had just witnessed. We will never forget this occurrence and are still very much haunted by it. We were all alone in the wilderness. Our theories are that we upset some Native American spirit and that it wanted us away from its land. We also think that maybe it was because we disturbed items used for witchcraft by a stranger. Our last theory, strongly believed by my two brothers, is that it was a skinwalker. We don't think it was a bear because of how loud and screechy the growl was. 
It seemed as if it were right in our ears even though the figure was several feet in front of us. Plus, the way it was moving was not bear-like. All we know is that we're terrified and we'll never think the same after this. We've learned our lesson about respecting items that aren't ours. And land that isn't ours. We just want to see if anyone on Reddit can give us any information on what they think it could have been. Or simply getting some comfort from others would be nice. We're currently wide awake here in the RV. P.S. I can post photos if needed of the wheat sheaf and the bones, although I really don't want to go back there again, if needed. I can also attempt to draw out the figure I saw in the grassy woods. Thanks in advance. Encounter with a Native American Spirit Last summer I participated in an archaeological dig in Florida for my major, which is anthropology. It was during that time that I saw something that chilled me to the bone. Before I start this story, I need to tell you about background information. My classmates and I were basically excavating a Native American site that was used from around the last ice age, about 11,000 BCE, to about the 13th century CE during a period known as the Mississippian, aka the Mound Builders. We were mainly looking for evidence of architecture or anything that could indicate permanent settlement periods in the area. During our excavation, we were fortunate enough to live in a rented hunting lodge that was close to the site. The lodge was big. It had about 10 bedrooms, two bathrooms, one large common area, a kitchen with a walk-in fridge, a dining room, a laundry and huge front porch. However, the only peculiarity with this lodge was lack of air conditioning. Instead, we had ceiling fans installed in every room. Despite this, drawback, we were actually pretty blessed to be allowed to rent this lodge. After all, the alternative was camping. Now, this lodge was in heavily forested area that was surrounded by swampland. This lodge was fairly close to the archaeological site. It took probably 10 minutes tops to walk to where we were actually conducting our excavation. Looking back, it was actually quite a fun experience. However, one thing that made my experience all the more memorable, and terrifying, was seeing something rather supernatural in the woods. It was about 1.30 in the morning and I was feeling kinda hot, so I decided to go on the lodge's balcony to get some fresh air. The night sky was pretty clear and there was a full moon that night I encountered this horrifying spirit. I had decided to take my phone with me so I could listen to some music and admire the fresh air. Just as I was about to listen to some trance music, I hear this blood-curdling shriek coming from the woods. I instinctively turn my head towards the noise. No more than a minute passes before I see these two blood-red eyes staring back at me from the woods. These eyes are attached to this humanoid body which appears to have bird-like wings. I immediately book it for the safety of my bedroom in the lodge. Once I reach my room, I slam my door shut and decide to hide behind my bedroom nightstand and roll down the blinds of my window for extra safety. Suddenly, I see a shadowy bird-like wing zooming past my window heading in the direction of a nearby town. Suffice to say, I got very little sleep that night. That morning, at around 7.30, I ask rather nonchalantly ask my professor whether these ancient Floridians had any sort of animistic beliefs, basically the belief that everything has a spirit, and my professor mentions that some Native American cultures like the Mississippian did believe that there were half-man, half-bird creatures that were considered sacred. I nearly dropped my bagel when I heard this. The thing that scared me was a Native American spirit. Funnily enough, I later learned in a lecture given to us by our professor that the site we was working in is in close proximity to a Native American burial ground. This just adds to the whole creepiness of my encounter. Thinking back, I still get goosebumps just seeing those two blood-red, soulless eyes staring back at me and hearing that screech. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.